so my name is Damien Toledo. I'm a co-founder and VP of engineering at Niamala. Niamala is a, a startup uh, based in San Jose, California, and we provide a solution uh, for DevOps to deliver cloud native applications on CCS and on multiple clouds. So today I'm going to talk about microservices on CCS and microservices in a general manner. So the, the first question is why bother? Why, why microservices? Why is it interesting or important in, uh, in the industry today? Well, I would start answering that question by asking another question is, how many times do you deploy actual changes in production today in your company? Uh, if you look at the industry today, you know that a lot of companies are still stuck in uh, you know, delivering changes every 12 weeks or even some companies every six months, right? And on the other hand, you have these uh, web giants like uh, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google, Amazon. They push every day multiple changes to production. Uh, if you look at some numbers like uh, for Amazon, they push uh, in production a change every three seconds, an actual change in production. So there's a gap between the majority of the enterprise and companies like that, right? Uh, so the idea is uh, if you are on the, on the right end of the spectrum, you're going to be uh, much better at competing with your competition, obviously, right? If you can deliver changes very quickly in production. So the idea is uh, you know, to ask ourselves, where, where is the gap? How do you go from these uh, long release cycles to you know, releasing multiple times a week or even a day if you need that into production? So there are multiple things to do, obviously, if you want to reach that type of agility. And microservices is one of the things you have, that you may want to do or to adopt to gain that type of agility. So we'll see that by combining, combining different technologies today, actually Cisco is able to help you achieve that. There are, again, there are other things you'll have to do probably in your company to achieve that, but uh, we have the building blocks to really uh, help you. So the first thing is be, uh, obviously to use cloud and to use uh, CCS into cloud. The second thing is to use container technology. So we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll see how it fits in this continuous delivery uh, picture. And the third thing is to use some automation on top of this to deliver and operate your application in the cloud. So the agenda is we will talk a little bit about microservices, see what it is and why it's important or useful in this context. Uh, then we'll talk about what it takes to develop microservices. So actually, I'd like to ask a question. How many of you are developers? If you can raise your hand. That's almost everybody. And IT and ops people? So you do both, actually. So that's why we call DevOps. Ends the, the word. So we, we'll talk about that, actually, in a second. Uh, so we, we'll look also at the operation side of microservices. And that's actually the, the challenge we are trying to solve at Niamara. We are focused more on the, on the operation side of microservices. But we'll talk also about the development side a little bit. So first, let, let's see where these microservices fit in the global picture, right? So th there are trends that probably you, you are aware of. Uh, you know, in the past, we used to treat our servers like uh, pets, right? When we had a problem, we would try to fix them and make sure they work fine. When we work in the cloud, everything is dynamic. If you have a problem with an instance somewhere, you just kill it, restart something else, and redeploy your application, right? Or well, at least that's the goal, to, be, uh, to, uh, to gain that level of um, agility. Uh, the other thing that we are seeing people forming these DevOps teams, and I'm glad that we are actually uh, people from representing that today. Uh, and, and we'll see a little bit later, I define DevOps a little bit differently from, I guess, some people define it today in the, in the industry. So we will come back to that. But the main thing that we want to discuss today is this shift from monolithic applications toward these microservices type of applications. And we'll see what it brings uh, in terms of advantage, in terms of agility. And again, the goal is to move away from these long release cycles and move toward continuous delivery. So these are the trends and where 
the microservices are fitting in that picture. So let's look at how it started. So if you look at the web giants I, I've mentioned, uh, you know, again, Twitter, LinkedIn, even Yahoo, Amazon, they all started with actually monolithic applications several years ago, right? And then when we needed to scale in the cloud, they started splitting their application into small pieces, right? And that's how really it started. At that time, it wasn't called microservices. Uh, you know, we had cloud native applications. They, they were multiple terms. But in the last six, mo uh, 12 months, people started adopting this term of microservices. Uh, so it's less confusing. We're all using the same term now. So they really started because they wanted to scale in a cloud. And we'll see that there are actually three different ways you can scale a service. So let's take a look at that. So th these are the three axes that you can represent. So the first one is you can scale by replicating your entire application. And honestly, that's how often people start in the cloud, right? If you have an on-prem software and you need to move to the cloud, what people are going to do, they are going to replicate the application multiple times in the cloud. Why? Because their application is not multi-tenant in most of the cases. So they're going to have one copy for each tenant. So that's one way of uh, scaling and to get started, actually, in the cloud. The, the other way is to read to split by functions. And now you can split your big application into functions, like, for instance, for shopping application, you can have a catalog uh, service, you can have a customer service, and you can have an order service. The third way to scale is to split by data. So it's more at the data layer that you would do that. You can do some ch charting, for instance. You can say that uh, one instance of your catalog is going to handle all the records from A to I, and then the, the next instance will handle the records from J to R, et cetera. That's another way to scale. Now, if we look at microservices, really they combine the first two axes to scale. When you use microservices, it's mainly this type of scaling that we are using. Again, the charting is more at the data level, uh, data layer that, uh, that we apply this type of scaling. So if, you, if we take here the example of this shopping application, what happens is first we're going to split first by functions. We're going to have one catalog service, one customer service, and one order service. And then each of them, for each of them, you can have multiple instances of these services, right? So you'll have multiple catalog instances. So that's a, an easy way, well, easy way. That, that's one way to scale your services. And again, that's how things started. Uh, it's true for some companies, for other companies, they really started microservices to change, to transform their organization. I, I talked to um, uh, somebody like Adrian Cockcroft, the, the architect at Netflix. Their problem wasn't scaling, actually, initially, but the coupling of the development organization. All the development teams were depending on each other, so this, they decided to create separate services just to gain this type of agility. So it was interesting to see that other companies actually started uh, not from the scalability angle, but from really the, the pure organizational angle. So let's take a look at a more, much broader definition of a microservice. Uh, that's one way of defining it. So first, first it's, um, it's based on the modular design, right? You want to have modules in your application. And that's what we saw with this shopping application. You had your catalog service, it's a module. You had the uh, customer service, it's a different module. The second thing that's very important, it's, it's service oriented. It means that each module is providing a service externally to either other services or externally to clients and other applications. And the third angle here, and again, that's the one I mentioned in the case of Netflix, it's also tied to your organization. And that's very important to understand if you want to really gain the agility that the microservices offer. You need to change your organization to fit this new architecture and new way of delivering your software in the cloud. Now let's look at some more uh, technical characteristics of a mi microservice. So if you take one of these microservices, like the catalog that I mentioned, in the shopping application, typically the characteristics 
of a microservice are, are going to be, they are elastic. It means you can scale up and down these services independently, right? I don't have to scale all my services at the same time. I can just take my catalog and scale that service. It means creating multiple instances, probably on multiple servers, multiple instances of the same service. For that to happen, you need to uh, develop this service in a specific way. Uh, mainly, it has to be stateless. And for the same reason, if you want your service to be resilient, it also has to be stateless. That's a very important characteristic of a microservice. Also, by dividing um, an application into smaller services, if there is a, f a fault, a failure in your system, you are going to isolate that failure to a small domain, right? Maybe your catalog is not going to be available for a few seconds, but then your payment is still running. People may not even notice that if they don't try to access the catalog of your application. And in the meantime, the system can automatically spin up new instances of your catalog to recover. These services, these microservices are composable. So it means that because they provide APIs, you can start composing this API to provide a higher function. Like in our case, we have the catalog service orders. Combined together, they provide a shopping application, right? So you can compose the, your services through APIs. And the next two characteristics is that these services are, have to be minimal. You really want them to be as small as possible. But at the same time, they have to provide a business function. So they need to be small because, again, for resiliency, uh, scalability, you want that. You don't want to scale the entire application. But yet, uh, you want them to be meaningful. They have to really provide one function, like the catalog is an entire business function that a service can provide. So if we look at advantages and disadvantages, so we mentioned some of them. Uh, the advantages, uh, fault isolation, definitely scalability. We started with that. Uh, it's also easier to train people. If you have things clearly isolated in services, you can have very small teams in charge of these small services. They don't have to learn the entire system. Typically, they're going to learn just few APIs that their services are going, going to need to function. And obviously, the small teams also will be in charge of delivering these services in production. So we'll come back to that. So that's really a, a way to enable continuous delivery. This architecture is really aimed at enabling continuous delivery. Disadvantages, so it's not a free lunch. Uh, there are um, you know, issues with microservices. Microservices basically are distributed systems, and this system and distributed system are hard. If you worked on that, like I did for almost 30 years now, you know it's hard. It's, and we, we have nice packages, nice tools. It's getting a little bit easier, but it's still difficult. There is no way around it at this point. On the operation side, also, it brings some complexity. So you really have to be aware of that. Now, instead of having one application you want to deliver in the cloud, you have uh, 10 services, 20, 30. A uh, company like Netflix, their application, the, um, you know, the, the, the online uh, streaming of, uh, of movies, it's made of 300 services, 300 microservices. That's their application. So you can imagine that operating that uh, poses some, some complexity. In some cases, you can observe some latency because now you have communications between services that can be across instances, across networks. Um, so you may, may be aware of that. So let's look at the development side of the microservices, then we, we'll focus a little bit later on the, on the operation side. So what does it take to uh, develop microservices? So first, you can start with a monolith pattern. That's what I said, and that's what most companies do. But it's more like an anti-pattern. That's something you don't want to do for a long time. Right? The goal is actually, because it leads, obviously, to uh, long cycles. And then it doesn't scale well. When you want to do modifications, you have to modify everything. What you want to do is to split the same application into multiple services. So, so some of the advantages that I haven't mentioned yet is, for instance, each of the service can be developed using a different language. So that's also a huge advantage now. 
uh, think about companies acquiring other companies, you can integrate quickly their services in your own application, even if they develop in a completely different language, if you adopt this style of architecture. And something also very important, they can be tested and released independently from each other. So that's the first pattern. The second pattern that you're going to need when you develop microservices is a gateway. Uh, all the microservices application I've seen have a gateway. Basically, the gateway is going to provide the entry point to your overall application. Right? You may not want to expose all your microservices outside. You may want to expose just a couple of them. The gateway is the one that is going to provide the access to your application. It, it can do uh, much more than that. And um, actually, if you look at our product, you can see that the gateway can, do, um, can help you do A-B testing, your blue-green type of developments, these kind of things. We can discuss that a bit later. So a gateway is typically required. The next thing you're going to need is naming, registration, and discovery. Because now these services, they need to communicate with each other, right? So what they're going to do is each of them, when they, come, when they come up, they're going to register to a central registry, or it could be a distributed registry, actually. And then the other ones, if I need uh, for my order service to talk to the payment service, I'm going to look up my payment service in the registry. Right? And it's very important. If you think about how these applications are dynamic, you don't want to hard code um, IP addresses or ports or anything like that. You just want to know the name of the service you want to talk to, and that's it. The registry should give you that. And for the same reasons, now your services, they can actually, you can scale up and down. Uh, the registry will give you the list of all the services. OK, looks like I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, so I have five more minutes. So there are other patterns that are, are very common in uh, microservices. I li listed them here. Um, I have some reference slides. Um, I won't go through that. Uh, but they, they are all very, uh, most of them are very important and very common. So let's talk about the operation side. So the thing I mentioned at the beginning, I define DevOps a little bit differently from what we hear today. Uh, if you look at people looking for a job today and they say, I'm a DevOps engineer, most of the time they are actually an ops person. Right. What I mean by DevOps is a developer doing operations in production using automation. To me, that's what DevOps is, is a developer doing operations using automation. What do you operate? Well, you operate applications. And your applications is somewhat decoupled from your infrastructure. And that's where the ops part uh, com come from. What we see now is companies are forming these platform teams, delivering the infrastructure, but the DevOps persons are the one um, operating the application. So who provides the automation? These platform teams. So automation is obviously critical in this type of environment. So how do you automate this type of environment? So containers have are becoming really uh, the standard for that today. That, you know, that's a reality, and especially Docker is becoming, for most companies, uh, the technology to deliver quickly this type of applications in the cloud. So it provides uh, interesting things, because they provide an, a standard interface to actually deliver these microservices. So it's easy to write automation on top of that. And that's what we have done at Nirmata. Basically, we are layer above Docker, uh, providing the automation. And today we are working, or we are part of a, uh, CCS Intercloud mar Marketplace. So you can operate microservices applications on CCS. So I think I'm going to skip the demo, but uh, there, uh, tomorrow I'll be here. If you want to stop by, we have a booth here. I can show you the product in action. I think it, it's going to be uh, uh, interesting to compare what I said and what you can do today actually uh, in the marketplace on CCS in the cloud. So we are out of time. Uh, maybe I can take one or two questions, but it was a, uh, it was a micro presentation about microservices. So hopefully that was useful. 
All right, thank you, everybody.